Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to share the stage with such stellar speakers who have run the gamut from robotics, rabbis, and rights for women, rights to vote, rights to marry. I think I might have some of Professor Darude's monarch butterflies in my stomach right now. Um, so I'll be talking about smart cities and how we can build the cities of tomorrow and how those cities are actually here today. But first, let's look at some of the pressing environmental and um, modern issues that face our world and why we need to have these smart cities now. So as a student of the environment, climate change is one of my primary focuses. And um, I'm sure many of you, uh, you know, the jury is out. We, we understand that climate change is happening. It's happening rapidly. You know, uh, pre-industrial, we had uh, CO2 emissions in 280 parts per million. Now we have 380 parts per million. We have rapidly receding glaciers. We have sea level rise. We're expected to see 3 to 7%, uh, 3 to 7% Fahrenheit uh, increase in temperatures in the next century. So we have to deal with these issues, and we have to deal with them now. Um, and then perhaps the defining trend of the 21st century is uh, population growth, specifically rapid urban population growth. In 1800, 3% of the world was uh, urban dwellers. In 1900, that was 14%. And in 1950, it was 30%. In uh, 2008, we passed a historic mile mark and became 50% urban. So while we may not have been meant for an urban species, we may have been meant to be hunter-gatherers, we are now an urban species, and that's what, are going to, what's what we will be in the future. And when we're projected to be 9 to 10 billion people in uh, 2050, that number could likely be as high as 70 to 75% urban. Furthermore, with so many people, we have very few resources to go around. And we're going to be looking at increased um, issues such as water scarcity, uh, energy, uh, the need for renewable energies, and just um, raw materials for construction. So this is, these are issues we need to deal with. And then finally, money makes the world go round. So we need to make these economically feasible. And, and without doing so, then we will not see a uh, return on our investment and better cities of tomorrow. So these are the issues that are facing us today. And we are confronted with this design problem. How do we design for people that there are more people than ever before? There are more people living in cities. We have a deteriorating environment. We have fewer resources. It costs a ton of money to build these things. Uh, what do we do? And the answer is smart cities. And a smart city I'll have, I would like to pose to you is integrating design and technology into the very urban fabric itself such that you're able to create a city that is a higher quality of life than cities of the past. And this, in turn, encompasses, encompasses things like an eco-city or a green city um, or a sustainable city because all of those things are inherently smart. And so something I'd like to share with you guys today is that this is not science fiction. This is happening today. And so first, I'd like to take you to South Korea. This is Songdo. It's an international business district. It's meant to compete with places like Singapore and Hong Kong. And this city has been built from scratch by a developer um, in concert with an a, a technology firm, specifically Cisco. Um, but what they also did is they, developed, they took a lot of design principles from other cities around the world. So something that's pretty cool, they have a central park like New York City. They have little pocket parks like Savannah, a little bit closer to home. They have a Grand Canal, just like Venice. Uh, they have a opera house like Sydney. And they've taken the best from all of these different places, and they've put it into one area, and then integrated that with technology. So you know, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to replace real time with Facebook and FaceTime. But what they've done is this thing called telepresence which means that you can actually communicate with other people from any building, anywhere, um, using a screen in front of you. And while this is not necessarily replacing the, um, the act of uh, direct communication with people, now you can have students in South Korea interacting with students in America in the same virtual classroom. Also, you can, instead of going to the, necessarily going to the doctor, which is something, you know, it's pretty difficult here in America, what if you just could call up your doctor and actually tell him about your symptoms and he could look at you right there and then? So there's some really great things going on. Also, they've been uh, experimenting with things like pneumatic waste. What if you have no more waste trucks, no more emissions? So there's some really exciting things happening, and they're happening today. Next, I'd like to take you to the UAE, which is Mazdar, which is meant to be a renewable energy city that's supposed to be completely 100% carbon neutral. So this city is actually interesting, mostly in my mind, because of the design and not necessarily the technology. So this picture shows you it's kind of kilt to current. Uh, or caddy uh, cornered, but the way that the city is designed is it's at a 45 degree angle to the equator. So every point of the day, there is shade. And the streets themselves are very narrow so that you have more shade um, walking along it. So you create um, an area where you can 
it really enjoy the outdoors. And one of the problems that we have right now with increasing um, global uh, temperatures is something called the urban heat island effect, which we all know about here in Atlanta, that the more sun uh, that hits impervious surfaces like concrete and asphalt, the more energy it absorbs. And so what they've done is they've essentially created an urban heat oasis because this is built in the desert and you've created an area where it's a couple degrees cooler walking along the streets than it would be if you were walking out in the desert right next door. And as you can see, it's not very developed further out this way. Um, so there's some really great stuff going on here. It's supposed to be 100% uh, solar powered and there's really cool things happening and that was designed by Fosters and Aru. Oh, excuse me, Aru. sorry about that. Um, but then also I'd like to take a look at some other cities that currently exist because one of the things is, you know, we'll see these cities coming to existence, for example, and by 2030, the urban population of China is expected to double, and that's why they're building cities. But there are also places where there is a urban population that's already set, and the city itself needs to be upgraded. So Rio de Janeiro is a great example of this, and what happened was back in about 2007, 2008, there were some really heavy rainstorms. You know, this is a tropical environment, and they experienced some severe flooding. And in response, the mayor, Eduardo Pez, said that we need to have some sort of response so this never happens again. And then the response to that was the um, operations center, the operations center of Rio de Janeiro. And what this does is it takes all of the public systems and services and integrates them into one place where he can actually remotely sense and control what's going on. So he is someone there who's looking at all the traffic conditions so they can reroute traffic, also looking at the weather patterns so they can predict where there are gonna be heavy rains, also looking at where the waste management is. And they can all be um, taken, at, looked at from bird's eye view and managed. So this is a perfect example of better data equaling better decisions for the governance of the city itself. And then I'd like to bring you to this idea of fix my street, which uh, you may, if you live in a place like New York or LA or London, have already heard of. This is an example where you, as citizens, are actually the people who are making the change. So if I can just get a, a brief you know, poll in the audience, raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Virtually everyone. You can make the change. So what happens with Fix My Street is you would be walking down the street, you notice a pothole, you say, I don't like that pothole. I take a picture of it, you send it in the app, and all of a sudden it gets sent off to the government, and then later on it will be fixed. And that way you're crowdsourcing the data using smart systems that are in your pocket. You know, the, the computer we have in this phone is better than the computer that we could produce, you know, for, for you know, to work with normally <laughs> like 20 years ago. This is an incredible device that you have in your pocket. You have the power to do that as a citizenry. You don't have to rely on your government to produce all these goods and services because you can yourself request them. So these things are happening today and there are many other case studies of urban operating systems or ways that you can be involved as a citizenry. But um, something I'd like to just look at for a moment is how urban form dictates one's life. So we have two examples here. One is New York City, one is Beijing. Um, the same distance from yellow star to green star, but they're actually very far comparatively when you try to walk those distances. Also you have issues with, you know, Beijing has a horrible air pollution, so you're not really wanting to be out there and walking these distances. And if you think about it, you know, you can either walk on a small road that has you know, some shops and things like that and enjoy your experience as a pedestrian, or you can brave the streets that have 25% you know, uh, increase in the car, uh, car fleet in Beijing every single year. More and more cars, and it's necessitated by the urban form itself. The form of the city is not expected to change for over 100 years, whereas if you're creating, so that means that if you're creating cities from scratch, you need to keep this in mind as you design those cities. And cities that are currently this way should be retrofitted. So if you could include a walking corridor through some of these super blocks in Beijing, for example, that would change your experience with the city itself. So through urban design and urban form, you can affect one's own experience in the city itself. You can make it possible to get the exercise that will make you less depressed, for example. Also, integrating technology into the system itself allows you to have a better uh, experience with the city and get more feedback from the, from the city itself and enjoy that experience. There's an example of a city in uh, Portugal, for example, that has an urban operating system run by Formula One sensors. 
to gain the most efficiency from the city itself, and that's how we'll be able to combat issues like resource scarcity and climate change, by getting the most efficiency from all of our systems and services. And the idea behind this is that better data equals better decisions, not only for your governance, but also for you and when you make your personal lifestyle choices. And so the fact of the matter is that this is not top down, as we've seen with some of these developments of new cities, but in existing cities, like Atlanta, for example, it can be bottom up. That what you request as a citizenry it can change the way that you live in a city to, of the tomorrow. And that is, in and of itself is smart. And that is what I call democratic design. So if I could leave you with one thought about this is, you know, how has the world changed? You know, we've seen this rapid uh, urbanization of people. Now we are increasingly um, an urban species. We've seen all of this stuff happen. And one of the things that I was thinking about when I was thinking about this talk is, this is the map that I grew up with. This is the map that I had in my room. It's National Geographic. It shows you the whole world. I enjoyed looking at it, and I you know, would find various places in the world. But one of the things that struck me when I was looking at this map is what does it actually emphasize? It emphasizes the boundaries between us, the national borders that divide us. That's what just jumps out at me immediately. And I think that's not the, city, the world that we live in, and those shouldn't be the cities that we live in. And I think personal connections are much more significant than the boundaries that, that come to define nationality. So here's another map. And this is what I would say is the map of the 21st century. And this is the anthropogenic planet. This is a planet connected by people all over the world. And this is what, how we talk to each other through trade, how we talk to it with communications, travel, a cultural exchange. And this is what the world is going to look like in the future. Because people, not any one event, not economics, not uh, climate change, are the defining feature of our planet today. And as such, we have a responsibility to live in the most smart, efficient, sustainable way possible. And that's why this city and this idea of smart cities is what we need to have happen. And the exciting thing is, because urban populations are growing in the developing world, what's happening is not necessarily uh, innovation here in America, but innovation in places like Southeast Asia, China, and India. So I think that we're going to have really exciting cities in the future, and I look forward to living in one of them. Thank you very much.